Hola. Hello. Hi. This is uh, Mr. Fernandez and uh, Muchacho here to tell you a little about how the Cold War heats up in the 1950s. Pun intended. Uh, the learning target for this brief uh, video lecture is you'll be able to describe the consequences of the U.S. policy of containment in the 1950s. You've already heard about um, the U.S. policy of containment and how it affected the 40s from the Truman Doctrine to the Marshall Plan to uh, the establishment of NATO and the beginning of the arms nuclear arms race. This video will tell you a bit about what happens next. And it starts before 1950 with the um, failure in China to keep China from falling to communism. Remember, the containment policy was all about making sure that n there would be no spread of communism around the globe, that we would contain the Soviet Union and communism to the sphere of influence it had already gathered in Eastern Europe, primarily. Um, the containment policy, therefore, and it made, it made it necessary for the United States to be vigilant all around the world to make sure that no other country turned to communism and, then be, and, and therefore closer to the Soviet Union. That fails to happen. I mean, the, the, um, communism is not contained in 1949 when China becomes a communist country, a communist government. Um, this happens uh, as a result of a civil war that the Chinese had been having since the 1930s um, uh, that um, they put on hold uh, when the Japanese occupied Manchuria, but then after World War II, the Chinese civil war continued. The communists were one of the factions in that civil war, and, after, uh, and in 1949, um, after several more years of fighting, the communists took over. Um, uh, with, uh, and their leader, Mao Zedong, um, became the, um, the leader of China. What, um, the, the reason that matters for the United States is because American leaders began to wonder to themselves, who was responsible for having lost, quote-unquote, China? How, did, how is it that the policy of containment failed so disastrously? How is it that the policy of containment could allow one of the world's biggest, most populous countries. The world, the country that we've been obsessing over, Westerners have, for hundreds of years. The country that um, the United States said uh, in its open door policy would have to be open to, um, uh, uh, economically uh, uh, tr um, open to all of the world. How is it possible that we lost China? And the reason that matters is because American leaders uh, the American uh, uh, political establishment swore it would never happen again. The containment policy would not fail again. So that's how we lead up to, to this to the Korean War. Um, uh, uh, the Korean War uh, was caused by um, by uh, a series of circumstances that began in 1950. North Korea um, after World War II. The Soviets and the um, and the Allied powers um, jockeyed over position, or jockeyed for position over the Korean continent. Um, Korea was liberated from Japanese rule at, at the end of World War II, in the same way that um, uh, we defeated Germany, um, uh, and then divided Germany in half. The Soviet Union would take the eastern half, and then the Allied powers would be more or less responsible for the western half of Germany. Same thing happened in Korea. Um, the Soviets insisted on having a piece of the of the Korean Peninsula that they would be responsible for, and the Allied powers, and especially the United States, um, administered so South Korea. Um, uh, in 1950, the military forces of North Korea invaded South Korea to try and change that by taking over the southern peninsula, the southern half of the peninsula. So look at this map. In 19 J June of 1950, you see the North Korean advance across the um, uh, the dividing line between North and South Korea. And within a few months, the, um, the uh, North Korean military had captured just about the entire peninsula, the, uh, the entire lower half of the peninsula, um, except for that little space here in purple. That's when the United Nations, um, uh, the newly organized body, international body of countries um, uh, established to cooperate and to maintain peace, uh, 
uh, issued a uh, directive to its members that North Korea had to be pushed out of South Korea. The United States led the effort, landing, uh, so in other words, this was a United Nations effort to f liberate South Korea from North Korean military. The United States was in charge of the effort, and mostly American soldiers were the ones who fought. They landed in November of, of 1950 um, uh, and began to push back the... Um, the North Koreans uh, out of South Korea. By July of uh, 27th of 1953, um, uh, the, the, uh, whatchamacallit, the, the war had settled into a stalemate. Chinese forces uh, crossed the border into North Korea and helped to push back the American forces and the South Korean forces across that dividing line. And this line is basically the line that they fought across for the next few years. In 1953, the, the United States agreed with North Korea oops, to sign an armistice, a ceasefire. And the Korean War was over, although a treaty was never signed, a peace treaty. In fact, even to this day, there is no North, Korea, there is no North Korean War peace treaty. Um, uh, what they have is an armistice, meaning a ceasefire agreement that has lasted for, you know, f 60 years. But the current situation in North Korea and South Korea, the division of the two Koreas, um, the, the North Korea being, you know, um, philosophically aligned with communism, um, uh, although, you know, the extent to which they're actually communists is, is debatable, is certainly a part of function of its in the influence of, the, um, of China and, at the time, the Soviet Union. And South Korea remained a pseudo-democratic, uh, not quite democratic country for a, li a little while before it actually transitioned into becoming more of a democracy uh, or a full democracy as it is more or less today under the tutelage and protect protection of the United States and its Western allies. That was the Korean War. But the point, the reason why um, the, uh, Americans, uh, American leaders went ballistic over the, uh, over the Korean Peninsula was because they did not want another country to fall to communism after China. And, um, and Americans were ready to fight, or at least American leaders were ready to fight a war to prevent that from happening again. Um, uh, the containment policy continues into the next uh, presidential administration, Eisenhower. Um, Dwight Eisenhower was a Republican, or became a Republican. Um, uh, he was most well known for being the um, supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War II. He was the most well known military figure probably in the world uh, during World War II. Um, and he used that popularity, despite having no political experience, he used that popularity to um, win the election in 1952. A Republican wins the election um, since the New Deal for the first time. But he's very much a moderate Republican, very much a supporter of the New Deal, um, uh, very much uh, a supporter of a, of a you know, a, a, an activist go a federal government, still very much um, a moderate um, Republican. <clears throat> um, and so, but he is definitely a cold warrior. Uh, int he's definitely uh, interested in maintaining the um, and furthering the containment policy. So, um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower is responsible for um, uh, pushing the containment policy into more of the uh, uh, of the world, um, into what was being referred to then as the third world. The third world in the Cold War era was the term given to the parts of the world that were not aligned with either the Soviet Union or the United States. There was the first world, which was, of course, the United States and its allies. The second world, which was the Soviet Union and its allies. And the third world, which was the non-aligned world. And the big, big, big anxiety and focus uh, during the 50s was, um, how do we prevent the third world from aligning itself with the Soviet Union? We can't let that happen. And so... Um, Dwight Eisenhower uh, ushered in a long period of time when Americans were very, very, very um, uh, in focused on the, on the so-called third world. During the 1950s, much of that third world in Asia, in Africa, was uh, undergoing some pretty dramatic changes. Particularly, the third world was involved in anti-colonial and radical movements in India, for example, which um, just achieved its independence from Britain and, and Pakistan as well, and other places. The big concern was that as these places became independent, um, 
and shed their colonial pasts, that they remain not aligned with the Soviet Union, they remain, uh, um, that they become allies of, this, of the United States in the first world. One way that this was achieved was through the use of covert action. The CIA was um, bec had become, by the 1950s, one of the most important um, American agencies in terms of fighting the Cold War. The Central Intelligence Agency um, was active all over the world, um, especially in the Third World, helping to um, undermine any effort to align a country with the Soviet Union or with communism. For example, in 1953, um, uh, the elected government of Iran was overthrown um, uh, it, by the CIA, in part by the CIA, um, uh, and the U.S. Uh, uh, backed the um, installation of the autocratic Shah or King of Iran, who ruled for, for you know um, another twenty years or so, 25 years before the Iranian Revolution in the late 1970s. But we, the United States, was responsible for toppling a democratically elected government in Iran and replacing it with a non-democratic government in Iran because the, um, the elected government of Iran was talking um, uh, about perhaps nationalizing the oil industry in Iran and doing other things that might bring it closer to the Soviet Union um, or to closer to the left. That was unacceptable as far as the United States was concerned. The containment policy called for um, preventing the, the spread of communism and leftist ideologies anywhere in the world. And that is how we prevented that from happening in Iran. In Guatemala, similarly, a leftist government um, was overthrown by, in part, the, uh, by CIA covert action. <clears throat> in the Philippines, um, an anti-communist dictator is installed in part by the CIA as well. So all over the world, the United States um, was using covert action and money um, uh, and other resources to undermine uh, and, and um, destabilize uh, a number of countries' governments in an effort to ensure that those governments were friendly to, towards the U.S., um, hostile towards communism, communism um, uh, and, ma and maintain f um, uh, good relations with us. Um, uh, Eisenhower further uh, uh, became interested in the Middle East, um, remember, as a number of, uh, as, as the Middle Eastern oil infrastructure became more and more um, uh, robust, it became more and more an imperative for uh, uh, the, the U.S. to ensure that access to oil resources in the Middle East um, remain uh, unfettered. And so Eisenhower came up with a, um, a doctrine, the Eisenhower Doctrine, which said that the United States will intervene um, uh, anywhere in the Middle East whenever countries are threatened by communism for the purpose of protecting oil resources and American uh, interest businesses there. So for example, in 1958, 15,000 troops were sent into Lebanon um, uh, to keep the peace there and to, and to maintain um, uh, uh, to prop up a government that was friendly towards the United States. In Asia, Southeast Asia, similar attempts to roll back or prevent communism from spreading um, could be seen in, uh, in Vietnam. The uh, Vietnam War doesn't really, the, the U.S. side of the Vietnam War doesn't really take off until the 1960s, but the war itself goes, the origins of the war itself goes, go back to, way back in the 1950s, and even earlier. The French, remember, were the um, colonial uh, power that controlled um, what they called Indo Indochine, Indochina. Um, uh, and for, for years there had been a, an independence movement in Vietnam, uh, led by Ho Chi Minh, um, who wanted to, uh, sh you know, to for for the for Vietnam not to be a colony of France anymore. The French um, begin uh, or lose the war against this insurgency um, in 1954 um, in the Battle of Dien Bien, Ph Bien, Bien Phu, um, and as a result, uh, international. Um, 
negotiations leads to Vietnam being divided in half, with the North being communist and controlled by Ho Chi Minh, and the South being a protectorate of the United States and, and its allies. The U.S. sends a ton of money and military advisors to defend the South from a communist insurgency there, which was in part being um, uh, supported by the, um, the North Vietnam. So, by the time the 1950s are over, the United States has a, several thousand American troops in Vietnam acting as advisors to the South Vietnamese government um, uh, in order in, uh, to help them fight against communism. And then finally, all the way back here in Latin America, there was the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Once again, the United States was involved in supporting governments that were um, hostile to communists. They didn't necessarily have to be democratic. In fact, very often they weren't. They just had to be. Uh, they just had to hate communists. Um, uh, that was the case in Cuba with a dictator named Fulgencio Batista. And after several years of fighting, a communist revolution led by Fidel Castro uh, toppled the U.S.-backed dictator. Um, uh, and install a new communist government. Uh, Eisenhower, before he leaves um, office, uh, helps to organize and approve an invasion of the of the of the island um, uh, by Cubans themselves who had fled the island, fleeing communism, um, by CIA trained Cuban immigrants. That invasion will eventually happen after Eisenhower leaves power in 1961, and it is known as the Bay of Pigs invasion, and it is a monumental failure. The U.S. does not provide air cover. The um, several thousand Cuban uh, immigrants who uh, are trained to invade Cuba to try and topple Fidel Castro. Most of them are either killed or captured. M uh, one of those was my father, um, who was captured by Cuban forces and in prison for a couple of years on, uh, in Cuba before the Kennedy administration um, agreed to a, a, a swap, I mean, uh, agreed to uh, ransom the prisoners um, of the CIA-backed invasion. Um, uh, in 1962, as Cuba became communist, um, uh, <coughs> there was a Cu there was a missile crisis in in, in Cuba. Soviets, uh, the United States, um, or Cuba became uh, allied itself aligned itself with the Soviet Union, and agrees to allow the Soviet Union to install missiles on uh, on the island. Um, the United States finds out about this through its intelligence gathering operations. Um, uh, and for several days, you have a standoff between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, which uh, the, S the U.S. sends its navy to encircle the, uh, Cuba to prevent any more shipments of arms. Um, uh, and um, the, you know, the, the country became super anxious about what would happen. Um, would this lead to a war between the Soviet Union and, and the United States? In the end, the Soviets agreed to remove their missiles from Cuba, um, uh, and uh, and the crisis is averted, but um, the containment policy moves on. Anyway, to summarize, there was a U.S. policy of containment, um, which said that the U.S. will stop everywhere uh, the spread of communism. Um, the consequences of that policy are that the United States um, maintains a large military force all around the world, a global presence, a nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. And like we talked about a couple of days ago, um, uh, the containment policy led to intervention in Europe in the way of the Marshall Plan, uh, the development of NATO, etc. And in Asia as well, um, uh, whoops, in Asia and other developing regions, um, uh, leading to things like the Korean War, the covert action on the part of the Central Intelligence Agency to um, to prop up governments that were friendly to the United States, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and eventually the full-on Vietnam War, which we'll talk about on a later date. Thank you for listening. Goodbye, and may the force be with you.